Hello everyone. Well, this is certainly a strange time to be doing a sermon. And it's even stranger to know that I'm not going to be standing up in front of you in church to do it. And even since Morris recorded his sermon last week with Paul in the church, I can't even do that. So here I am at the dining room table, hoping that you'll be able to see the sermon. I hope wherever you are viewing it, that it brings you some understanding to deal with the times we find ourselves in. And I have to say, as I was preparing the sermon, I was really distracted. Um, the devil usually potters around the week before you're doing a sermon, but this week was really, really hard. Um, but anyway, here we go. Preachers are also encouraged to have a lot of real life examples, uh, applications in their sermons. But with this one, I really could not find many illustrations to, um, to reflect what was happening to us today. So forgive the lack of illustration, uh, but just use the sermon along with others as an encouragement for the coming months. So to bring you up to date, we've been doing a short series in Luke. And this series was decided well before COVID-19 became a serious problem. In fact, we all met in December uh, in the church and gosh, the luxury of meeting together in person. But somehow all the sermons have been very relevant to the growing crisis and it just shows that God always knows what he is about. So going back, Daniel and Anne asked, who is this man? And talked about Jesus as the one who forgives our sin. Jen Miller followed through on who is this man and we find that if we know him he changes us and he is the one who sees us through the storms and brings order out of chaos. Very relevant. When Morris preached from Luke 9 18 to 26 we find if we want to follow this man Jesus the one who forgives and the one who sees us through the storms we need to deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him daily. We make a choice to pick up our own cross, which is a cross of suffering, obedience, a cross of identification with Jesus, and lastly, a cross of love. Morris also talked about how we sometimes need to change our daily cross. And if there ever is a time we as disciples of Jesus are required to change and be resilient. This is the time. So I'm going to continue uh, along the theme, what it means to follow Jesus, which is the focus of the sermon. And I continue with verses Luke 9, 28 to 36. And these verses are known as the transfiguration of Jesus. And I'll read them to you now. Luke 9, 28 to 36. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John and James with him and went up onto a mountain to pray. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor talking with Jesus. They spoke about his departure, which he was about to bring to fulfillment in Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with him. As the men were leaving Jesus, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what he was saying. While he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice came from the cloud saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and did not tell anyone at the time what they had seen. Luke makes much of the glory in these verses, much of glory in these verses. Moses and Elijah appear in glorious splendor, and when the disciples become fully awake, they see the glory of Jesus. His body undergoes a change in form, a metamorphosis, so that it shines as bright as lightning in the dark night sky. 
At the time of the Transfiguration, Jesus' earthly ministry is coming to a close. He has acknowledged that he is the Messiah and predicts his death and resurrection. Now, he reveals to a select few his divine glory. So Rick Warren has a good quote here. What is the glory of God? It is who God is. It is the essence of his nature, the weight of his importance, the radiance of his splendor, the demonstration of his power, the atmosphere of his presence. A door opens on the real Jesus to inspire and encourage us to continue to follow him in all circumstances. When Jesus is transfigured on the mountain, there are three things I want us to consider today. When he's trans transfigured, he gives us a glimpse of who he really is. That's the first thing. The second thing is, we see him, which increases our confidence to be his disciples. And the third thing, seeing such glory encourages us to be transformed. So that's three things we're going to look at. And the first thing we're going to look at is our glimpse of Jesus. So one of the things about Jesus that causes people to doubt his claims is that he doesn't show off his powers. The crowds want to see God whom they hear about in the Old Testament. When Jesus says he is, he is God, they want to see the God who shakes the foundation of the earth, who comes down and fills the temple with his glory like he did in the time of, times of Moses. The crowds and the disciples think that if only God would show his power, then they can believe. We are the same today. People today want to see a God who reaches down and stops wars and hurricanes, tornadoes and disease. A God who writes his plans for us on walls with a magic finger. The God who would clap his hands and end the pain and suffering of this world. But strangely, God doesn't work this way. Jesus lived most of his life in a, in a state of humiliation. And while he occasionally gives people a peek into who he really is by feeding the hungry or healing the lepers, most of the time he doesn't because it takes the focus of his message about salvation. Seeing Jesus glow with dazzling brightness and hearing Elijah and Moses talk stuns but also encourages the disciples. They get some inkling of the difficulties ahead, but, but they also get some very real confirmation that Jesus is really the Son of God. As he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. This is my Son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. Confirms that Jesus is God's Son, chosen for a special task. Later, everything is turned upside down when Jesus is arrested and then crucified. The disciples are dispersed, confused and troubled by everything. So one hopes that when they reflect back on Jesus' life, and especially that day on the mountain when Moses and Elijah talked with him, what takes place in Jerusalem, what takes place on that hill, starts to make sense. So I think we can safely say our world has turned upside down and inside out at the moment. And we are very confused and troubled. And in the same way we have seen him calm the storm, this glimpse of Jesus, this glimpse of his glory, reminds us that Jesus is the Son of God and that we are his disciples. And we can cope with change because we are shown that the Father really does have a plan. So that was the first thing uh, I wanted us to have a look at, which was the glimpse of Jesus. The second thing that I want, uh, the second thing we want to look at, is that this experience on the mountain gives confidence. It gives confidence to the disciples. 
The glimpse of Jesus strengthens our faith. And to quote Morris from his sermon, it allows us to be what he wants us to be and to do what he wants us to do. This revelation is more than just a show of glory. It's the giving of an invitation. It's a summons, a call. And it's a call which Peter remembers and recalls many years later. We are invited to commit ourselves. And our commitment is an act of personal faith. We are invited to make a personal commitment to a personal Lord and to entrust our lives into his service. We are promised that as we commit ourselves, we shall be led step by step into a fuller understanding of what that means and we are given the confidence to be his disciples. As Peter, James and John witnessed the incredible event, Peter finds himself enthralled by the glory that poured, poured out from Jesus. He is so overwhelmed that he wants to stay on the mountain, so the experience never has to end. And Luke writes, As the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. But Jesus reminds us that while we may, like Peter, want to remain on the Mount of Transfiguration in the form of a perfect life, and while we may want to live in the glory of God, that's not possible. As we know at the moment, life thrusts us into unpleasant situations, situations that aren't glorified at all. The cost of following Jesus is emphasized through Luke's writings especially in the section of the gospel, gospel where Jesus journeys towards Jerusalem. Here he reveals to his followers precisely what it will co cost to follow him. It will mean adopting a lifestyle of radical renunciation of family, possessions and securities. It will be a costly discipleship. And years later, Peter describes how his glimpse of Jesus gave him the confidence to follow through after Jesus died. From uh, 2 Peter 1, verses 16 to 18. For we did not follow clearly devised stories when we told you about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and power, but we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. He received honour and glory from God the Father when the voice came to him from the majestic glory saying, This is my son whom I love. With him I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this voice from, come from heaven when we were with him on the sacred mountain. And Tom Wright, which is a book that um, Jen suggested in her sermon, he says, We too often find it completely bewildering to know how to understand all that God is doing and saying, both in our times of great joy and our times of great sadness. But the word that comes to us, leading us to follow Jesus, even when we haven't a clue what's going on, is the word that came from the cloud on that strange day in Galilee. This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And the father didn't mean listen just once, but listen again and again and again. And as we listen and look to him, we're comforted and gain and have confidence in the reality that Jesus is God. And no matter what sufferings we'll experience in the world, there is a plan. The Lord said in Isaiah 46, My counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. And that is a really great promise. So we get a glimpse of the glory of Jesus. We gain confidence as his disciples. And the third thing I want to look at today is the way we are encouraged to be transformed. At the time of the transfiguration, Jesus' earthly ministry is coming to a close. He has acknowledged he is the Messiah and predicts his death and resurrection. And now he reveals his glory. When we think of the transfiguration, 
We think it is Jesus who changes, and it is his body that undergoes a change of form. And that word metamorphosis, but in fact we are shown the real Jesus. It is the disciples, actually, who are the one, ones who are changed. Although their immediate response is to make sense of it by immediately building something very physical to commemorate what they have seen, they actually end up keeping the memory of the glory of God with them into their ministries. They are transformed by what they have witnessed. Romans 12, 2 Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to discern what is good, pleasing, and the perfect will of God. And the goal of this transformation is to become like Christ and to live like Christ. We are not to be transformed by the world or act like the world or be like those in the world. I found this quite nice quote about this um, from a guy called Sidney Harris, who was a newspaper writer. And he says, our dilemma is that we hate change and love it at the same time. What we want it for, what we want is for things to remain the same, but get better. For things to get better in your life, you must change. To change, you must be involved in the process of renewing your mind by God's word, so that you are pr proving in practice God's good, acceptable and perfect will. Remember that in our efforts we're not alone. God is at work in us. We also need to remember it's not the ecstasy of the mountain experience that makes us disciples of Jesus. We are encouraged by the experience, but it is how we cope with it is how we cope with what the world throws at us and the compassion and sympathy we show for others in the valley below. It is not the mountaintop experiences, but the cross of love that we carry that lasts forever. We are shown that no sooner that he got off the mountain, Jesus was met with a woman, by, was met by a woman with a sick child who begged for his mercy and healing kindness. And that's in Luke 9, 37 to 38. The glory of the mountain top was short lived at best. So I want to encourage you today. Uh, pretty difficult. Um, if you've been listening today, you will have heard the COVID counts are going up and all that. But I want to encourage you. Despite everything that is going on around us, we have a glimpse of the glory of God. We have confidence that he empowers every one of us and we are made anew as his disciples to be an expression of his love to everyone around us. And I have um, one last quote to say before the sermon ends. It comes from R.C. Sproul. And the quote is, we are secure, not because we hold tightly to Jesus, but because he holds tightly to us. Thank you.